Ladies and gentlemen, this is Joe's Classic Video Games back with another cool arcade repair video for you today. We work on a lot of these centipedes. I actually have two of them in right now, and then I've got this third one that I'm working on. And I figured, uh, since we're about to work on the board on this one, that I would film a video showing you just kind of the steps that we go through um, whenever we work on one, just so you can, if you've got one and you want to try to tackle it, uh, you can check it out yourself and see... Uh, uh, see what kind of issues you're looking at. So I'm going to show you step by step how we go through it. This one I've already got powered up. Uh, if you buy one, you're likely going to do the same thing. Plug it in and then you end up with something like this or worse on the screen. So let me show you what we do to figure out what in the world is going on with this. Okay, so the very first thing you should do, and I'm going to go through it pretty quick because I want to get to more of like the board repair area. Uh, we've already done this on our machine because we've tested several boards in it. We're using it kind of as a test bed right now. But the first thing you want to do is look on the schematics and make sure that you've got the voltages that you need to run the board. If the board doesn't have the right power getting to it, it will never run. It won't work right. Okay, so you can see here on the schematics what it wants. So it wants ground, a negative sense line. That means a negative, uh, a ground line that basically goes back to the power board. It's used to sense the actual voltage condition on the board. But the negative sense will also be a ground. Uh, the positive sense will be actually the 5 volt. And again, it's, a, it's actually a connection going out to the board so that the board, the uh, power supply, so that the power supply can see what the 5 volt condition on the PCB is. So ground, ground, 5 volt, ground, 5 volt, 22 volt, and negative 22 volts. Uh, those are used on the board to create some other voltages. 12 volts. <laughs> And negative 5 volts. So this particular one, a centipede, uses, uh, you know, everything that the Atari uh, power supply can throw at it. So this is the reason that it's not easy to just swap a regular power supply into a centipede because you've got a 22 volt and a negative 22 volt um, that you need in addition to the 5, negative 5, and 12 volt. So I'm going to show you on the board where you can actually check for those voltages on yours to make sure that they are there. So here's what the centipede board looks like. And like I said, we're going through this part pretty quick because most of you probably already know this. But uh, luckily on the Atari boards, they're pretty well labeled. So you've got a little loop here for ground. Okay. And then your 5 volt uh, is right here. Sometimes there will be a couple of them too. Like there may be another 5 volt somewhere else. I see a whole bunch of other grounds. And so you, you're just going to use your multimeter, black on ground, red on 5, and see if you've got 5 volts or somewhere near it. That is the most important voltage. Uh, if it's below about 4.9 or so, you're probably going to start having problems with the board running. Because every chip on the board needs that 5 volts because it's how the logic actually works. So, the, you know, a logic signal is either ground, which is 0, or five, which is five. There's also tri-state ones, but in most of this, it's it's uh, the logic uses just two uh, voltages. So it's zero and five. Well, the reason that it won't work right if it's below five is let's say it's at 4.5. So the chip is sending a signal, you know, it's more square, but the chip is sending a signal, digital information between the the uh, the chips but it never gets up to five, so it never gets to really a high state, so the chip can't really interpret it as high. So it, it sees the signal coming in and it's doing this, but it's never going all the way to five. So to that chip, that signal might, might as well just be a flat ground. Okay, so your, your five volt has to be about right. So you need to be at 4.9 or so up to 5.1 or so. The closer to five you can get it, the better. Okay, so if your board's not running, that could be it. But then you've also got your other voltages. So you've got a place here to check plus 12. You've got a place here to check minus 5. And then we've got a place here to check minus 22. And a place here to check 22. So these two voltages actually get turned into two other voltages. And so now you have a 15 volt, right, and a negative 15 volt. Now you wouldn't think it'd be all that com all that complicated, but... It's just how they were designed back there. So there's several voltages. So that's the first thing you want to do. You make sure you make sure you've got all of those voltages. If one of them's missing, you're probably going to end up with problems on the board. Okay. Now a couple other things to mention. 
sometimes the big cap the the power supply the capacitor down on the bottom there is a big blue capacitor in the bottom of the uh, power brick uh, that can go bad after a while and whenever it does uh, on some of your voltages uh, you will get a lot of noise on it the, or the AC is basically bleeding into the DC there's a way to check that to see if it's any good and then also the edge connector often will burn up so if it's a game nobody's ever messed with you may have a problem with that blue capacitor uh, you know we can talk about how to test that and then you're you may have a problem where the edge connector has burned up if this connector is burned up one of these voltages will be really low probably the 5 volt so instead of having 5 volt if that connector is all burned up you're probably going to have you know 4 volt or 3.5 volts if you test it and you're getting 6.5 volts or something like that almost 7 volts on your 5 volt turn everything off you got a serious problem with your power supply the power supplies on these, uh, if they've never been serviced, sometimes the, the voltage regulator on it will short out to where it just sends a, a raw 12 volts uh, to the board. And whenever it does that, it, the 12 volts doesn't completely go to the board. On the board, you'll since there's such a load, you'll, you'll measure like, I think it's 6.8 volts or something like that. If you let that run very long at all, it'll start burning up chips all over the board. So don't, be careful about that. Okay. So... If you know your power supply is fine and your board is definitely the problem, which is where we're at with ours because we've already checked all of the power supply voltages, then you're to the point that we're at now, right? So what we're going to do is, or what we've already done is, we took all of these EEPROMs out and checked them in a um, EEPROM burner to see if they're correct, right? You probably don't have an EEPROM burner unless you're in the in the uh, uh, hobby. And if you're in the hobby, then you probably uh, already know all of the stuff that we're talking about. Uh, but you have to make sure that the files are good on these chips. The good news is the files are usually good on those chips. If you look, these are actually the original ones with the original stickers on a 42-year-old game, and they're still fine. So usually you don't have a problem with them, but sometimes you do. So if you're working on one... Uh, luckily, once you get the program running in the machine, it will actually check them for you. It'll tell you if one of them's wrong on this particular machine, on a centipede, right? But I went ahead and checked them all, and they're all fine, just because I have the equipment here and I can do it. Uh, what you can do if you don't have the equipment is remove the chips and clean the legs off. You can use really light sandpaper. This is something we were doing wood with earlier. Don't do this one, people. This is way too coarse. If your sandpaper is 80 grit, don't put it on the chip. <laughs> but really light sandpaper, you can use an eraser, some people use, but you just want to make sure that you don't mess up the legs. But you can clean the EEPROMs and put them back in. Some of these Ataris have bad sockets. If you look, you'll the socket doesn't look very good and it's filthy and isn't making good contact with the pins. If you get that kind of problem, you may have to swap the socket out. But we're just trying to make it as simple as possible so you can understand some concepts of repair and so it doesn't sound so um, um, uh, overwhelming to you, right? So clean your chips. You got the power supply right. Check the board and see what it does. Um, so a lot of times on Centipede, it'll come up and do exactly what ours is doing where there's just trash all over the screen, all kinds of stuff. We've got two more chips I need to show you. This is the CPU. It's a 6502, right? Same thing, you kind of need to clean the legs on it. This is a, a replacement one that somebody's put in there. This is the Pokey chip. It has a really strange number on it. It means pots and keys. The, the stamping is the other way, but it's C O one two two nine four zero. looks like, something like that. Those are hard to find. Atari's Pokey. But luckily, the board will run without that. So if it comes up and it won't run, you might try taking that off the board and then just trying it and see if you get the exact same thing. If you do, maybe put it back on because you're going to need it for the audio. So what it does is, uh, uh, it does several things, but one of the things that it does is it provides the audio. So we're going to be attempting to run an audio test. If we can get the program to work on the board, um, uh, the, the board will start beeping at us through the speaker and that beep code will tell you what's wrong with the board it does a RAM test okay so that's what we're trying to get okay so the CPU for the CPU to work 
it needs a, a few things. It needs good power. We already tested that, so it should have good power, right? And then it needs a, a reset signal. So when it first comes on, there is a reset signal that holds it low and then lets it go high for the rest of the time that it's on. The reason that it does that is so that the thing uh, has a good chance to start in a known state at the beginning of the, of the, uh, um, the game turning on, powering up, right? And then there is also a clock signal. So the information that's stored in these EEPROMs and the, the, just the logic and everything that it's running, for it to send those signals, it needs something to provide that timing, right? It's like uh, surfing. If you're a surfer, if you go out in the water and the water is just completely stagnant, you can't surf on a lake very easy without a, something to make waves or to make movement or something, right? So the, the clock circuit provides that movement. So it sends out a steady clock, and then if this wants to turn it, turn something on, it can turn it on for a little bit of that clock, and then turn it off, and then turn it back on. And so it uses that clock signal uh, to make to make all of the stuff work. Now this is a very simple way of explaining it. It's much more complicated than that, but you don't really need to understand all of it, right? My whole point is this needs power, a reset signal, and a clock signal, or the board will never work. Whenever the screen uh, is crashed like ours with information on it, you can kind of look at it and tell what's going on. And I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so if people get good enough at repairing these, a lot of times I've seen techs that can just look at what's going on and tell what's wrong with the board. I'm not quite that good. But if, if you look, uh, look, there are little, uh, see the little mushroom? So it's a centipede. See the little shooter guy? He's there. There's a little copyright symbol. There's a bunch of letters. So what does all that mean? It means that the, the EEPROMs are in some way being accessed because how in the world would the board know to draw a picture of a mushroom? Like, that's not just a random Big Bang thing. I mean, <laughs> it, it has to be... Uh, there's some kind of intelligent action going on there or it wouldn't be able to tell how to make the letter K, you know? So it's not just garbage all over the screen. Yeah, it's garbage, but it's not just random garbage. It's stuff that the game actually uses. So letters and uh, little space, sh little shooters, and uh, you know, there's a little piece of the centipede there, and all of that. So it, it is accessing at least some kind of information. So what does that mean? Well, the clock is probably working. You know, or it wouldn't be able to read any of that information, or at least part of the clock's working. Um. And also, uh, the clock is used to make the sync signal, which syncs the video to the screen. So since it's all stable and not rolling or anything, that part of the clock's definitely working. So since you've got sync and it's static on the screen, most of your clock, at least, is working. So we, we've probably got that, um, but we've got some kind of issue where it's not able to access half of the stuff, or we've got a whole bunch of RAM chips that are bad or something. So... So we're going to uh, we're going to go over what to check next, but we'll we'll go ahead and check the clock signal just to make sure. We'll check the reset signal, and then we'll start looking for address lines, data lines, things like that. And I'll show you how to how to check that on your board uh, or any other PCB that you might be working on. That you know they're all basically going to have the same kind of uh, concept behind them, although the implementation might be a little different. So let's look at the schematics. Okay, so I'm just looking at some, some schematics online. This is the CPU, so this is where you kind of want to start. And if you look over up here at the top, see the VCC, so there's the power that it needs. Okay, and then we're going to go down here to pin 37 there. That little symbol is the clock symbol. So we need to see if we're getting a clock there. Okay, and then we go down here, and there's our reset signal at 40. So this is a 6502 CPU. So this needs to be low and then go high. Okay. So we're going we're gonna to check that and see if that's what's going on. And we're going to check and see if we have our clock signal. We should have both, but uh, a lot of times you won't. So we'll, we'll check and see what we're getting there, and I'll show you how we're going to check for that. Okay, so here is the board that's actually in the game. The one we were looking at on the table is actually a, a you know, pretty much identical one. Uh, but on this one, we've done what we did on the other. Check the power, check the EEPROMs, everything's cool. Okay. So here is our CPU. 
So the way we're going to check it is with a logic probe. These things are pretty inexpensive. They're about 20 bucks. Okay. You might be able to find one local. You may already have one. If you don't, you can get one from us. We have a link to it on our website. Go to lionsarcade.com. We have a parts page uh, where we have a bunch of links to stuff like this that we use in our repairs. You can order one from there. If you order anything else while you're on Amazon, so say let's say you go look at our little logic probe and then you buy a sports car, it gives us like a tip for sending you there. So we appreciate everybody that does that, but you don't have to. If you've already got one or you get one somewhere else, that's fine too. So we're going to check for the clock signal. It's pin 37. So pin 1 starts below the notch. It's 1 through 20 and then 21 through 40. So you can kind of just count backwards too. 40, 39, 38, 37. So this is pin 37. And so it's showing me high, which is the red light and low, which is the green light, at the same time. It's because it's a, it's a signal that's moving up and down, right? This is basically a test point that Atari has provided to do the same thing. Now after you do it a while, you can kind of tell just by hearing it that it sounds like a clock signal. It's really fast, high-pitched, and it's smooth. Okay. If you're missing that, you basically need to look on the on the schematics uh, in the clock area. But ours appears to be here. Okay. Now we don't know that it's right though. It could be that it's not correct, but it's at least there, right? The logic probe won't tell you if it's correct. You need an oscilloscope for that. Okay. And then we're going to check the reset, which is pin 40. It should be low when the board starts and then go high. Oh my. <laughs> so what is going on? It's continuously resetting. Over and over and over again. Reset, 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 reset. Okay. That's why the board's not running. It's trying to run. Basically, it's holding it low and then going high. And then it's trying to do something. It can't do it. And then it's saying, oh, we're screwed up. Reset it again. Go high. Reset it again. And it's doing it twice a second. So twice a second, the thing's crashing. I've seen some boards where they call that the watchdog circuit. right? I've seen some boards where um, it resets once every like six seconds. Not centipede, but... Uh, so I guess depending on how it's set up, some of them will reset very slow. I think Battle Zone's like that. I think Battle Zone, the watchdog resets like every six seconds or something like that. So uh, you might get it where it's running for a second and then it crashes and does it again. Okay, so our problem is something's resetting over and over again. The reset circuit. So why would that be? Well, that's our first signal of what the problem is. Okay, so this is a very common problem. So that pin 40 is bouncing up and down. Low, high, low, high, low, high. But remember, it's supposed to only do it one time right at the beginning, but it's doing it over and over and over again. It is literally resetting it, right? But it, it should stay high all the time. So that signal comes from this counter. So the counter is making it do that. So a lot of people think, oh, the counter, the, the reset circuit's messed up. It's usually not the actual reset circuit. The reset circuit's working just fine. It's resetting it over and over and over again. It's working fine, right? It can go low and it can go high. Now, if it stays low, it's always low. Well, yeah, your reset circuit might be messed up. Or if it stays high, it's always high. Even when you first turn it on, yes, your reset circuit might be messed up. But if it's going low, high, low, high, low, high, it's probably fine. Knock on wood. Okay, so... Why is that doing it? It's because of this section right here. See where it says watchdog with a line over it? So basically, not watchdog. So it's it, usually the, the board tells it on that line not to reset the whole time that it's running. So how does it do that? Now you don't really necessarily have to know all this, but it just helps you understand what's going on. Well, see that signal comes from over here. That's it, not watchdog comes through here, through a, a right line, and then out of this 74 LS42, which is used to like do some address decoding or whatever. All right? And then that thing is fed by these lines, these address lines uh, that come through this buffer chip that come from the MPU. So what's going on? 
basically the MPU is starting up, it's going low and then high, it's resetting, it's got the clock and everything, and the MPU starts trying to do its thing, which is run Centipede. So it's, it starts trying to talk to the EEPROMs, it's trying to talk to the RAM, it's trying to talk to everything, talk to this chip and tell it to reset this line so that the watchdog doesn't screw up, right, or whatever. Uh, or not reset the line or however they've got it set up. Control the watchdog, right? And it's not pulling that off. So since it doesn't do that, the watchdog thing fails and it resets and does it again and again and again and again and again. So ultimately what's happening is the CPU is not running code. It's running into some kind of problems. So that is our signal there that the program is not running properly. Now we kind of already knew that because the screen's so screwed up, right? But since we're not even getting any noise, any sound, it's a static screen, there's nothing really going on, um, it's not running much code at all. It's not even running enough code to give us an error message. It's just there's not, there's, the screen's all screwed up. So hopefully we'll get a little further along and then you'll see what I mean about the error message. Okay, so what, how are we going to fix that? Well, what we're going to do first is we're going to check on this, on this CPU and see if any of these address lines are moving, if they're even trying to do anything. And then also these data lines. So there are little lines here. This is the data that it sends out. Basically, you should always have all of your data lines pulsing. Okay. Now, the address lines, not all of them will pulse right at the beginning like we are right now. We're literally running for half a second and then resetting over and over again. So it may not even be to the point where it's using all of the address lines, but we'll see. So we're gonna write it down on a piece of paper and see what all happens. Okay, so I've printed that out. We're gonna see uh, if it's doing what it should be doing. So again, we're just using the logic probe. We're not using an oscilloscope or anything like that. So the first address line is pin nine. So nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, it skips pin 21 because it's the ground. 22, 23, 24, and 25. 24 and 25 are not really used. Okay, so we're starting at pin 9. So 9. Now why is it beep, 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 beep? It's because it's resetting. So it's a pulse, and then it's resetting over and over again because of the reset line, right? It's so pin 9. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, whoa, <laughs> 19, 20, one good thing about slipping whenever it's resetting over and over again is it immediately resets and it doesn't matter. 21 is ground, so it's always low. 22, 23, 24, even though it's not really used. And 25 is kind of pulsing, but it's not really used, okay? To me, that all kind of looked a little weird, actually. They're all working, but I don't think they're supposed to be working. At the very beginning, that, it's like there's too much uh, action. Okay? So let's do the, the data lines next. 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, and 33. So the address lines are all kind of doing something. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26... Uh-huh, 26, 27, 28 is high, 29 is high, 30 is low, 31 is high, 32 is low. Okay, and by the way, I, the way you hook the thing up, I didn't show that, but you just hook the... Black lead to ground, the red lead to your power source, which on this board's five volts. Okay, so all of these data lines are dead as hell. They're either high or low. So what's causing that? 
Well, it could be whatever they're attached to. Like it could be this B2 buffer chip. But that's that's not... Usually you don't see something like that. I mean, it could be. And then they all run off the board here to something else. But I think the something else uh, may be this test socket on the edge. Um, if I was going to guess, just from past experience, I think maybe that's a fake chip. See how it looks newer? And the address lines, it's got all of them working, except for the last one. And then none of the data lines are working. I think that may not be a 6502. Maybe that's something else. And it's just a fake chip or a bad chip or whatever. So the first thing I'm going to try is just to swap in another 6502 and see if I get something similar. Luckily, I have other ones. But it looks like that one's been replaced at some point, and it may not be a real chip. So that's the first thing we're going to check and just see if on a couple different 6502s we get the same kind of results. Okay, folks, so again, here is the data lines going out, and they go to this buffer. It could be that the buffer is so screwed up that it's locking them all up. But then you get this. Look, the data lines also go to sheet 2, side B. So let's look at that sheet. So the only thing that they go to <laughs> is the pokey. So this is one of those do as I say, not as I do things. I did not try, I forgot to try it without the pokey in. So the pokey does attach to all of the data lines, is the only thing that attaches to all of the data lines other than that buffer chip, and is known for going bad. So I'm going to try it without the pokey in, and let's see if that frees up our data lines. All right, folks, so we're, the problem that we're running into is the chip uh, is trying to access the ROM. I believe it's D1 that it has to get first, which is chip 307, the, the software number. So it's trying to, it's trying to uh, access one of the chips, um, and it needs to, the buffer to have the data travel between the two. There's an, I think there's another chip involved as well. These two buffers are doing their thing with the address lines. Everything's doing what it should. The data buffer isn't doing anything, although there are three inputs that are pulsing. But they're not, uh, the, the chip itself is not turning on or any of that. So it could be that we've got a bunch of dead lines on the actual chip, or it could be that the ROM is not being properly addressed, or it could be that the two scratch RAM are screwed up, um, which are 2114s, I believe. Yeah. So we've got, we've got a problem with, you know, for it to run, it needs to access the ROM, and it needs to access RAM, and it needs to use the buffer chips. So something in that is screwing us up. I took the pokey off just to make sure that that wasn't shorting out all of the data bus and it was not. It got the exact same thing with it on or off the board. So I think the first thing I'm going to try just to make sure everything's clean is I'm going to replace this buffer chip uh, on the data line just to make sure that's not holding all the lines down since it's one of the only things that's common to every single one of those data lines and none of them are working. So um, I'll do that first. We'll see if that does anything and if not after that maybe we'll look at the RAM chips. Okay so we have replaced that buffer chip. Now again, the reason we've replaced it, I'm trying to explain it all as pedantically as possible just so you kind of understand. The 6502, it should have it should have uh, action on the data lines. And you saw that a lot of them are stuck up and stuck down. There are only two things that attach to these data lines. This buffer chip which is how it creates the data bus, right? Which talks to all kinds of things. But the only thing that actually talks to these lines is that chip and the pokey. Taking the pokey out, they were still exactly the same. So you could have a situation where the stuff on this side of the data bus is so screwed up that maybe it's screwing up this side of the buffer chip, but not usually. Okay, so we'll go back and check. 23, 24, 25, pin 26. That is much better. 27, 28, okay. 29, 30, 31, 32, is that it? Uh, yeah. No, 33. 
23. Okay, so now they're all pulsing. So just for giggles, that looks real clean to me. Our reset line is stuck high, which is proper operation in the game. Maybe we're up and running. What do you think? Let's go look. Uh, voila, we're in test mode. Now, the screen looks a little weird on this one because this monitor, the blue keeps cutting in and out. So basically, you're seeing red and yellow and green. You see the blue just snapped on. There's a problem with the blue gun on this tube. So that's the last thing that we need to fix. But, hmm. Okay, and we're getting we're getting uh, sounds, which means that the pokey's working. Well, there's some blue. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it uh, maybe the blue's just fine. Let's go out of test and see what we got. It's definitely misadjusted, but yeah, see the blue locking one. It's definitely misadjusted, but uh. That's a working centipede. Very cool. Okay, uh, we'll finish it up, work on the monitor a little bit, and then I'll show you uh, what we end up with after that. Okay, so another thing we get asked about a lot is how do you tell if it's a problem on the monitor or if it's a problem on the board? You saw how the blue wasn't right. And you could tell something's going on with the monitor because it was locking on the blue. Uh, it's probably the tube. But if I pressed the buttons, once I got to about the 10th color, the blue was there. So it's just weird. What in the world? So that could be a board problem or the monitor problem. So how do you figure that out? Well, you <laughs> connect it to another monitor. So this one is still in progress, this game. Uh, but it has a uh, nice working monitor on it. Although the horizontal is off a little bit. The hold is off a little bit. But you do get your white and your blue on it. And if I go through the colors... There's a blue. That's black. It's just the, the, the colors are overdriven right now. There's another white. So the, the reason that you're looking for a white screen is because the only way to display that is if you have all three colors, red, blue, and green. So they're a little bit off just because of the, the monitor being misadjusted in this cabinet. But uh, you can see that the first screen should actually be like a white, although on this one was kind of yellow. But... You should be able to display white on a couple different screens. So we've definitely got some kind of issue with the monitor in this cabinet. So I'm going to uh, um, we're going to look at the um, CRT with a tube tester. Okay, folks. So this is an old tube tester we've been using for years, a B and K four sixty seven CRT restorer analyzer. So we have our uh, tube plugged into it. Now I've got the monitor unplugged. I also unplugged the board. This is that one we were messing on, messing with with all of the wires screwed up that we still need to tidy up. But I've also unplugged the board. And the reason is because if you've got a bunch of voltages going around all over the place, you don't necessarily need it zapping anything. So I like to just unplug everything. Uh, really nothing can get from the CRT into the, uh, into the PCB or anything like that. But just in case, I like to unplug everything because you're going to be zapping the hell out of some stuff. Now this tube we think is bad. And we think, uh, that it's basically trash if we can't fix it. So immediately when I put it in setup, you see that there is a short... Between the heater, the blue gun, the green gun, and the red gun. It is not happy. Okay? So this tube likely is done. I don't even know if that's a short that you can get rid of. Let's see here. This is the wrong manual. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the manual for it. I'm pretty sure... We rarely get a short over on this side, so we're probably we're probably done with this one. But we'll try it. So setting the heater to 6.3, which is what it usually is. The G1, whoop, G1 
it's usually on 50 and then that's the line voltage we've got 118 or something like that going to it it looks like if you've got this I don't believe you can remove those shorts there's a short there's a remover over here but we'll move it up into the cutoff thing but probably got some serious stuff going on Okay, so basically we're in set cutoff, and we're we're basically uh, adding one notch on each one of the meters with the red, the green, and the blue adjustment. And it's different for each rejuvenator. So we're just one notch above zero. That's kind of how this one is supposed to be done. It says set cutoff and add one division at the top left there. See it? Okay, so we're in set cutoff. Let's move to test. It's telling us that our red gun is good. Our green gun is good, but a little weaker than the red one. And our blue gun is good. Okay. Um, if you look at where they're set, though, this one is right here. And we're good. This one is at about 1 o'clock and we're pretty low. This one is at about 11 o'clock and we're good. Okay, so we're having issues where our blue is just missing. The problem is it's shorted uh, to the heater. And that's not really one that you can get rid of. You, you can get rid of it if you uh, hack up the monitor board. So the monitor PCB has a heater circuit uh, that attaches to ground, and it's the same ground that the cathode's attached to. If you cut that off so that the ground is different, and then run a separate power supply for the heater voltage, it will no longer be shorted. It isolates it. We're not going to do that, though, because you got to hack up the board, and then the board only works on that tube. We're basically we're going to have to put a new tube in it. As you can see, so the, our problem is on the blue, right? And as you can see, the blue is actually fine. But we have that short, okay? Let's go back and check. Yeah. Looks like there's also a short on the red, and there's kind of a short on the green. So we just, we got, uh, we got problems with our heater circuit, unfortunately. So that's not something that you can really fix on the tube. So another one rides the bus. So we're going to have to swap in another tube. Unfortunately, this is a small neck K7000 tube. You can get those out of uh, vintage TVs like from the 70s and the early 80s. Um, and uh, we've probably got one floating around here somewhere. So we'll swap another tube in and that should fix all of our color issues. All right, folks. So we have swapped out the tube with another tube that we had. We actually had one off of another monitor. This is not a TV tube, so it's got a little bit of burn in, but you can't see it uh, because uh, it's a very dark game. <laughs> the whole background's black. If the lights are off, how could you possibly see it? So it's got a little bit of burn in, but nothing, nothing. It doesn't have Pac-Man burn in or anything. So everything looks pretty good. Uh, the greens are nice and green. The whites are nice and white. Um, and all of that. So we think we've got it adjusted pretty well. Now if you saw the previous video, we did another video of this where it showed just basically the whole cabinet, uh, but uh, we're still testing the board to make sure everything is fine. So let's give it a little spin. What do you think? We've got it on free play. It's saving high scores it looks like. That, by the way, people think that the spider is the hard part of the game. The spider is not hard at all. If he comes out from this side, all you got to do is get on that side of him. He never goes back. So it's like if he, so you just came out on this side. If you were to get to the left of him, he can't hit you. It's impossible. He never goes back. That guy is the problem. I call him the praying mantis, but I don't know what he actually... What are they... I don't know what they call him. I think it's a... I don't know what it is. It's probably not a praying mantis. Uh, it's a lizard or something. I don't know what it is. But the little guy that comes across, he's the problem. Because what he does is, he turns that guy, look at him. He turns all of those mushrooms a different color. And now, whenever the centipede hits the mushroom, it makes them drop straight to the bottom. 
That's the problem. Because he gets he gets to you quicker. Look at him. There he is again. And he does it constantly. Little sucker. All right, so keep an eye on him as we play, and you'll see what I mean if you if you haven't ever paid attention to that. Also, you get more points if you wait till the spider gets closer to you. So you get 300, 600, or 900, depending on how close it is to you. You can control when the fleas drop. See, they're not dropping right now. It's because there are mushrooms down on the bottom of the screen. If the mushrooms are at the bottom of the screen, they won't drop. But if I get rid of them, they start dropping. Screwed around and let me let the guys get to the bottom of the screen. Mm. It got hot there for a minute, people. was up just slightly too high come on now come come on people you can't leave your nose up slightly too high C come on now that ain't right you can't do that people look at him going all fast you see him you see that sucker well now i'm slow I've been slong to people. Mm. They hit me with the squeeze maneuver. That's a you can do that, but it's tough. You gotta be just just right. Alright, one more game. score. It's pathetic.
So basically when you shoot, it has to go off the screen before you can shoot again. <laughs> I think I just did the same thing. It has to go off the screen before you can shoot again. So if you're sh if you line up your shot with one of the with one of the uh, mushrooms, you're only shooting from here to there and then you can shoot again. So if you waste a shot and it misses and goes all the way up the screen, it takes you too long to be able to shoot again if you're if you're trying to do rapid fire, you know, where you're just where you're just uh, making a wall of shots, basically holding the button down. Um, so Another thing I guess is you could go up and do it too. Too many games. You gotta be all the way at the bottom. You can't be like sticking up a little bit. But you know how it goes. You get better as it goes along. Maybe one of these days I'll get good. I think I'm gonna stay here tonight and just keep practicing. All right, folks, so there you go. I hope you enjoyed it. We got the board working. Hopefully if you've got a board problem, that'll help you get yours working too. So uh, leave your comments below. Let us know what you think. Make sure to subscribe to us if you haven't already. And uh, we appreciate everybody joining us tonight. If you're looking for another channel to with good quality entertainment, <laughs> check out my brother Donnie. My brother has his own channel. He's crazier than I am. So we do old arcade games, pinball machines, jukeboxes, repairs, and things like that. He does uh, old trucks. He does some farm stuff. He does old uh, buildings things like that. So go check him out and we will see you on the next video. Centipede, what a classic.